Hello, my name is Steve Tegler. I'm a director of systems engineering uh, at VMware. And today's uh, Lightboard session is a very simple one. Why OpenStack? We have seen OpenStack get um, tremendous uh, traction in the market, and I want to talk about uh, why, that, um, why that is. And really what um, it starts with is the folks that would be actually consuming OpenStack. And those are the actual application developers or owners. And what's important to understand is what could an existing internal process look like for these folks to deploy infrastructure and then to deploy their application onto that infrastructure. And it typically goes something like this. They've got some requirements around their application that they need to deploy, and they fill out a form for the infrastructure team. This could be a ticketing system internally, um, an email to a friend. Either way, they're going to specify what they need. So they, maybe they need a couple of uh, uh, quantity two web VMs, and those need to be uh, two vCPUs, two gigabytes of memory, uh, and maybe a 10 gig disk. Uh, maybe I need some security parameters where I allow in uh, 443 and maybe 80. Okay? So they basically fill out this form. Maybe they need uh, load balancing as well, um, and so on and so forth. And so what happens is that after they fill this form out here, the form or ticket is then sent to the infrastructure team. And I could say that's one individual, but chances are it's probably at least three. And those uh, three teams are responsible for compute, then networking, and typically the security team, because there's probably some firewall rules that, uh, that need to get opened up. And then those folks will then read the information with their eyes. Then they will actually go to their infrastructure and actually deploy the topology requested. So in that case, I'm going to deploy a couple of virtual machines here, connect them to a network, provide a load balancer service as a part of that network, um, and then maybe I've got also an application tier that was requested, and we've got some routing in between, and then we need to get to it externally. Okay. So what happens here is we've got the application team, they fill out this form, the form goes to the infrastructure team, infrastructure team sees it, then they deploy it. And if you're lucky, it all gets deployed correctly and there's no uh, errors. But in a lot of cases, there's some back and forth on security, maybe this specific situation requires a security exception, and then, so anyway, you get the point. There's, there's human beings and uh, it takes a long time, so to deploy this, um, you know, is usually on the order of days, if not weeks and months. It just depends on your IT department. So then you've got the application developer owners. They finally have their infrastructure in place. Then what they have is their bag of tools. And those tools are things like Jenkins, Puppet, Chef, Git. These are all the tools that are available in their tool bag to actually deploy their application. So once they get the information back on where their instances are, where they've been spun up, the IP addresses and whatnot, they plug that information into their tools, and then their tools will end up go down here and actually turn this into a web server and this into an app server and deploy uh, the application configuration and whatnot. So it's a two-step process. It's deploy the infrastructure, then the applications team comes back and actually deploys their application. What's happening with the introduction of uh, public clouds is that this team has this ability to, uh, or has this tool bag, which not only can deploy application, but it can actually deploy infrastructure. So how does that work? So in that case, let's talk about a very common cloud, which is AWS. And the thing that AWS has is that it has a well-documented API. And it's got an ecosystem of tools wrapped around it. 
So these tools like Jenkins and Puppet and Chef, they have natural integration with AWS and can consume AWS infrastructure. So the process here is a little different. Certainly they have their application code, they can deploy their application, but what they're going to do now is that they're actually going to write code for the infrastructure itself. So what does that look like? Well, it's a lot of the same information that's available in their ticket request, but it's in a very specific format that the public cloud can understand. So as an example, we say maybe web, um, uh, a web VM, and its name is web XYZ. Okay? Um, in addition to that, maybe uh, there's this thing, uh, a term called flavor, which up in AWS, they have these flavors called, uh, that have a very common uh, nomenclature of M1 small, medium, large, and basically, uh, that's the t-shirt size approach to the size of the instance or virtual machine. So maybe the small uh, indicates two CPU, two gigabyte uh, memory, and a 10 uh, gigabyte hard disk. Okay? And so as uh, the developer fills out the information, they merely need to specify the size of the VM they want that is uh, available within AWS. Now, on top of that, um, they need to know what image to use, so it's the size of the instance, and then you need to know the image. Maybe it's like RHEL, uh, you know, with a chef agent prepackaged on it, or or, or whatnot. Um, and this could be an image that the developer uploads or customizes or configured, or one in the public cloud. Finally, what about the security? So security um, for uh, for this instance, maybe it references something called web security. And really what we're talking about here is this, um, uh, the ability to reference a configuration lay down later in the code. So in this case, you go all the way down and you've got a bunch of uh, parameters. So one being web security. And a part of web security is that it has definitions for um, what ports are allowed in and out. So maybe in is uh, 80, uh, 443 um, and uh, maybe 8080. And so what happens is that you can kind of see the, 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 the gist of this, which is they basically write code for the entire infrastructure. Okay? And what that allows them to do is if they write this code, they can push that to the public cloud and that will allow the public cloud to actually go and configure this for them. And they're using very, very basic what we call infrastructure primitives here. And so how does this all relate to OpenStack? Well, it relates to OpenStack because there is good and bad about the public cloud. The good is that there is you know, an API and it's well documented. Okay? Um, it's fast. The developers have complete autonomy. So they don't need to talk to anyone to actually provision, they just need to write the code to provision uh, the infrastructure. Okay? And most importantly for developers, they have autonomy, but there are tools and an ecosystem available so that these tools have native integration with AWS. Now, the problem is though, there's some negatives associated with this. Um, so first of all, in the case of AWS, it's a proprietary API. So if you write your code um, to AWS or use um, some proprietary features, you're potentially locked in. <clears throat> Next downside is data sovereignty. So what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that um, in order to get data in, it probably doesn't cost anything, but at some point in time, whether you go production and you don't want to put production in the public cloud, or you need to pull your data out, that's probably going to cost you money. Okay? So not to mention the whole security aspects of can I put my data in a public cloud, is that okay or not? So there's usually some sticky points around data, so that can sometimes uh, be seen as a, um, uh, a negative of, of using the public cloud. Now, finally, there is um, uh, this concept of if developers are using the public cloud and they're testing in the public cloud, 
Are they also running production in the public cloud? And in some cases, for the state, uh, sometimes uh, mentioned in the data aspects of this, maybe some companies uh, can't put the actual customer data in the cloud for whatever reason, so they actually have to run production in their own data center. And so what happens is that this code that you write, the testing that's done in development and test runs great in AWS, but then when you bring it back in-house, there's all these little nuances between running the public cloud versus on-prem. So that was a lot of information around the public cloud. So how does that relate to OpenStack? Well, what OpenStack can provide is all of, the, um, all of the benefits of a public cloud, like an API, except in this case, we are a vendor neutral API. And so what that means is that the community is responsible for the maintenance and the features and the functionality in the API. It is not an actual vendor. So if I wanted to deploy OpenStack today, um, and then change my OpenStack distribution to some other vendor or use different technology, provided my developers are writing code to the OpenStack API, I can potentially change, um, uh, change everything under the covers. Okay? So the vendor neutral API um, gives tremendous benefit from a flexibility standpoint if you're the infrastructure teams and the choices you make. Um, but the other thing it does is provides uh, you know, a vendor neutral API. So the tools and the ecosystem end up um, uh, supporting this vendor neutral API, which is common across multiple, multiple vendors. Okay? So a lot of this native integration with Jenkins, Puppet, and Chef that we have, say, with AWS, that integration also exists in OpenStack. And so um, in OpenStack vendor neutral API, your uh, data is on-prem. So there is none of this moving in and out of the cloud. All your data is on-prem. It's secured in your data center. So you don't have these data sovereignty issues or moving data in and out. It's bandwidth in your data, in your data center. Okay. Finally, dev equals production equals test. So if I'm testing OpenStack and I've got vSphere as the hypervisor underneath it, as I move from dev production to test, I know the uh, performance characteristics of the vSphere hypervisor, and I can be rest assured that the configuration that occurs up here, if it's running a dev prod or test, will run, uh, for the most part, the same, um, dependent on the performance of the actual underlying hardware. But it removes a lot of the variability as you move from dev prod um, to test. Now, there are some negatives with OpenStack, um, perceived negatives, I like to, I like to call them. Um, the first is, Stability. So stability is a big one in that um, uh, you know OpenStack is perceived as not stable. But there's a whole other Lightboard session that, which talks about OpenStack architecture and stability, which I encourage you uh, to go watch. The next uh, negative is that OpenStack does provide a lot of choice of infrastructure under the covers, and those ch that choice um, in effect creates snowflakes in my environment, okay? And snowflakes uh, can result in, you know, again, the stability aspects as I'm building something unique, okay? Um, finally, the expertise. So expertise is kind of interesting because um, really, uh, if you read a lot of the blog post, it requires a lot of experts to run OpenStack. Well, that's when you leverage OpenStack and you leverage open source infrastructure under the covers. It takes a lot of effort to get open source technology working underneath OpenStack. If you choose VMware for all of the infrastructure, this expertise goes away because you already have VMware knowledge on your IT teams, typically. And then finally, um, the last negative with OpenStack is the governance aspect. And, and so this one, um, there's not much VMware can do because this is a fundamental trait with OpenStack itself, is how do I govern and, and set policy around what people can and can't do? And right now, OpenStack doesn't have that. Now, the reality is if you go up to a public cloud and the experience these developers are having with the public cloud, it's basically the same experience. There is no governments. It's the wild, wild west. They can do whatever they want. So as you can see, OpenStack is really about um, positioning an on-prem cloud that developers are used to using. So instead of leveraging the public, they can come internally and consume resources that way. Hopefully you found this uh, useful and informative. 
Uh, I appreciate you tuning in.